Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out, and I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide, that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. My guest today is Dr. John Leaf. Uh, He's a neuropsychiatrist with a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics from Yale University and a Doctorate in Medicine from Harvard Medical School. He's known as an innovator in several medical fields. Uh, He pioneered the creation of integrated treatment units that focus on complex patients with combined medical, psychiatric, and neurological problems. And he built some of the first geriatric medical and psychiatry hospital units with the largest geriatric treatment network in New England, which he directed for 25 years. And furthermore, he's an expert and an innovator in developing specialized innovative treatment programs for brain-injured patients. We're here to talk about Dr. Leaf's new book, The Secret Language of Cells, which synthesizes 12 years of intensive analysis of scientific literature in a way that makes it clear and understandable for general science readers and experts. Now that the book is done, uh, he's back to writing blog posts about cellular biology, neuroscience, and microbiology, with a special emphasis on how conversations among cells determine all aspects of biology. So, John, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Yeah, tell me, um, what's your career path been like? I, I speak to, uh, you know, a lot of scientists, and I would say probably 90, maybe 95% of them are still in the uh, neo-Darwinism paradigm, and no one seems to talk about uh, cell-to-cell communication, or if they do, it's just machine-to-machine communication, but it seems like your perspective is different. So, just tell me yes. about your uh, your background, your history, and how you came to well, uh, this unique perspective. I really was a doctor. I was a neuropsychiatrist during my career of 45 years, and I treated uh, medically sick patients who had uh, mental problems, and I treated mental patients who had physical problems. I treat dementia patients. I started many head injury programs, so I was a, a, an expert in head injury and dementia in uh, the elderly, and uh, not too many people were interested in that. So I was able to start programs, and uh, we had many large programs over many years. So I was always a, a scientist at heart. My father was a scientist. My mother was a scientist. And I was always interested, but I raised seven kids. I was very busy. I was working as a doctor, running programs. So it was later about... You know, I wrote professional books, and I was I was uh, successful in my field. I'm well known in a small group of uh, experts in uh, the brain, uh, in in the elderly, and dementia, things like that. Um, so, but I started becoming interested in what is mind and where is mind, and I realized I had no idea. And the more I studied, I realized no one had any idea. So 
I figured what I would do is rather than write a book about something no one knew anything about, I started a blog in uh, 2012 called Searching for the Mind. And basically, I what I would do is I would go into professional journals and find uh, very advanced review articles in the top journals in science and nature. And I would basically translate them into English. So people asked, do I speak foreign languages? I said, I speak uh, molecular biology and molecular genetics. That's my foreign language. Because it really is gobbledygook. No one has any idea what these papers are saying because they're just so much jargon and it's almost impossible to decipher them. So I kept writing articles about the human brain at first. Then I got very interested in animal brains and I was, you know, I studied, I did articles on the large animals, elephants and how remarkable, you know, dolphins and whales and things like that, dogs. But then I became interested in birds, how remarkable they are. I wrote a, a number of articles about birds lizards. Lizards are very intelligent. But then I was very struck by the fact that insects are extremely intelligent. Bees understand abstract concepts. They understand they have a language, a very detailed language that does things we can't do. They can talk about the angle of the sun, exactly where things are, how to get there, how good they are, how not. Anyway, ants are much more intelligent individually than people realize. It's not just the hive. But then the most remarkable thing was microbes. I, I was shocked by how intelligent cells were. And I started writing blogs about many different kinds of cells, both microbes and human cells, immune cells, brain cells, but individual cells and how they communicated with cells far away. How would they know how to talk to a cell halfway around the body? How would they know to be sending information back and forth to an immune cell traveling to an infection. And, and then the, one of the most remarkable things was I was studying viruses. So I wrote articles on my website about a lot of the major viruses. I wrote about HIV, Ebola, uh, varicella. And here you have just basically a molecule, a DNA or RNA molecule with makes a couple of proteins, and yet it's able to uh, evade these huge, enormous cells, thousands of times bigger than them, all kinds of evasion techniques and all kinds of manipulations of the cell, they would take over the whole cell. It's really remarkable. And they're just a little strand of DNA or RNA. But what was really shocking was that about uh, four years ago, they now I always assumed viruses were very intelligent by their behavior. But, you, you know, you can't prove that. And I couldn't prove that they were communicating also. But then the signal was found. Four years ago, they found a signal from viruses whereby... What do you mean? What's, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that one virus sends a little peptide, a, little, a couple of amino acids stuck together. And that signal means either let's keep this cell alive and keep going using it, or let's kill it. We're done with this cell. And that first signal was the beginning of understanding the virus language. So they had language also. Since that time, there's been many more signals found, and they're found in uh, 15 different types of viruses. Uh, these were phage viruses. These are viruses that uh, live on microbes. And uh, they basically run the world, though, because they kill half of the microbes in the ocean every day. And they determine how much oxygen we have. They determine the atmosphere. Phage viruses are, are really the most dominant life form on Earth. And there are more species than there are people. I mean, we don't have any idea how many species there are. But, it, but in any case, I became very enthralled with how everywhere I looked, cells were talking. And that's how, and then it dawned on me that that's how everything works. That's how biology works. That's how life works. It's not that life is defined as a cell, it's that life is defined as an intelligent cell who can talk with other cells and make decisions about the physiology of our body, about health, disease. And how do you know that, that cells are talking and when someone says, oh no, it's all just random and you know, oh, well, clearly that kind of thing, what, what, do you, what do you say to them? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. 
please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. If you Well, I don't say anything. I just wrote a book, and I say, look at the data. Look at what's happening. You have a, um, a capillary cell is sitting there near an, a, an organ that's infected, and it sends a signal that goes all the way down to the bone marrow. You know, these are tiny cells. This is like sending a signal from New York to California, you know, uh, walking. You know, it's, uh, it, it's like walking along the wall of China. So you send a signal and you say, here's where the infection is. And they call the kind of white blood cell that's needed, the particular kind. And they tell them how to get there. And they tell them to climb against and they send signals to help them. And then when they arrive at the spot, they signal back and forth. And then they open up a way for the white cell to climb into the into the tissue and there are many, many examples. Another good, easy example is plants. Plants invite microbes in to build a, a factory to make nitrogen. And they send about 100 signals back and forth to make sure it's a friendly microbe, not an unfriendly. When they're convinced it's friendly, they invite them in. They step in a little bit. They make a pathway. At any point, if they realize that microbe is not a good microbe, they, they can stop it and they do. Uh, but when it's a good microbe and they invite them in, they then build a thing around them. And then the microbe makes a deal where they make nitrogen in exchange for all kinds of uh, goodies, all kinds of sugar and all kinds of, and they live there. They live out their life there. But this is all done through back and forth communication. I mean, clearly neurons, everyone, everyone knows neurons talk to other neurons. They send signals. Right. I mean, we all understand that. The thing we have to understand is that there's no difference between the brain and the immune system and the rest of the body. It's really all one big brain because all the cells are talking to each other like the neurons talk to each other. It's just that immune cells, I call it the wired and wireless brain. The wired brain is the brain that we think of, which has these, you know, although it's pretty active, but it's, it doesn't travel around. It, it's, it's sort of fairly structured. But the immune cells are traveling around and they are sending signals back and forth with the neuron in the brain. And I, I mean, I can go in you. I can give you examples of that if you want. I mean, so how do you how do you pick apart the language that they use to communicate then? If you know, so once we accept that they do communicate. Well, that's the whole game that that becomes healthcare. That becomes the way to define how to deal with diseases. That becomes the way to have treatments. In other words, so cancer is an example. Cancer cells are extremely intelligent. They are like super microbes. They develop a community. I mean, we all accept that microbes are communities now, but, but we don't think of cancers that way. They're, they're much bigger, more complicated cells, and they develop a community where they're communicating and defending each other and building this world. Um, and they do this by... Uh, a lot of ways, but one of the ways is by signaling back and forth. Like they'll see the way microbes send information to help defend against antibiotics. They'll send it like a virus. It's a little piece of DNA or something. And it's a gene that allows them to fight an antibiotic. The same way cancer cells do that. They send information back and forth in these little sacks. And those, those information they send allows their comrades to fight against a particular medication. Then also, uh, they intercept the ordinary conversations of the cells around them. So for example, the connective cells, the fibroblasts, they, inter they uh, manipulate them to become friends. And then the fibroblast cells start helping the cancer grow, and they actually build the structure for them. They manipulate immune cells to help them rather than attack them. They manipulate blood cells to build special blood vessels where immune cells can't chase them. They uh, manipulate neurons because neurons are involved in regeneration of tissue. And here they use these neuronal signals to build the cancer. So cancers, uh, if we understand that this is an active community signaling, 
we can then make inroads into uh, how to fight it. And uh, we fight it through this natural signaling. So for example, they signal to T cells or viruses. So we use those very T cells or viruses to fight against them because we know they're already talking. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. What are some of the mechanisms by which cells communicate that you understand? Like what are, uh, well, know, actually, how many different ways do they use and what, you know, do they just yeah. use chemical gradients or what else do they use? What, what I did in this first book is I just wanted to make a visual, it's so complicated, I wanted to make a visual tour of what's happening so that anyone could see by reading it, it's kind of like a visual thing where I'm just describing what goes on and how cells decide this, decide that, signal there, signal there. I didn't go into great detail, although I did describe the sacs and some of the tubes uh, but the major emphasis is on how many, many different cells are doing this. Uh, right now, I'm working on a, another book of how the more details, because the way it works is very complicated. Of course, of course, the, the obvious signals, most of them are molecules that they secrete, and it either goes right next to them or they send it uh, to a, in the blood or they target it in particular little ves- vesicles, little sacs covered with membrane, or they have these little nanotubes where cancers love nanotubes. They have many, many nanotubes. Microbes use nanotubes. There are nanotubes in the brain, uh, but we haven't proven yet that the neurons use those for signaling, but they probably do. But also there's electrical signals. Neurons, we all know, use electricity, of various, and there's various kinds of electrical signals. There's waves, there's brain waves, there's uh, the axons, but there's also just uh, electricity uh, around the cell and that helps build organs. It's a communication of a gradient. So for example, how do you make a hand? How do you know where the tip ends of the finger? Well, these these are gradients, electrical or chemical gradients that tell cells what to do and when to stop building and when to make the tip. So, and all of it comes down, of course, to genetics, because these signals are being manufactured by the DNA, RNA, protein process, which is remarkably complicated. But I've been trying to simple, I've been trying to write about that recently, about how a cell finds a situation and then changes by switching gears and changing the genes and changing what proteins you have and things of that kind. So where do you think cellular memory resides? Does it all reside in the cell? Or do you think there's a, maybe some information matrix that cells attach to Well, that's, no, that's necessarily not in the body? Well, no one knows. So I'd be speculating. I, I'm happy to speculate, but I want to be clear that I'm speculating when I am. What I huh. did is for my website and my book, I made a commitment to only describe absolutely proven science from the top journals. So everything in my book and my website is like from Science Magazine or Nature Magazine. It's from these review articles of the top scientists. Just it's written in gobbledygook, so no one knows any of it. But if we, when we start talking beyond what is proven, but what seems to be, uh, I'm happy to talk about that. I just want to be clear that your question goes beyond what is known. That's fine. I I invite your speculation. I understand that is. Yeah, it it certainly is reasonable that there are um, information and energy matrices that are operating. You you know why I say it? So like if you look at a a cow that has just been born, it's able to stand up and move around within seconds of being born. How does it do that? You know, or a whale that starts swimming or a dolphin that's or a baby crying and suckling. Where is this information? There's no way it could be taught. Babies, actually, recently it was discovered that in babies that are just being born, there's a thing called neuroplasticity, whereby cells change themselves in order to become more functional. And that's how memory works. But one of the things is where uh, the neurons in an area are are myelinated. They create myelin, which makes the, the nerves work better. Turns out there's a there's a little we thought that the myelination in, in these regions of the brain happened years later. Turns out 
before the baby is born, there's a little region that knows about English and Spanish and knows about the language that they're being born into. Uh, so some of that is genetics. Now, how, how they know what genes to trigger are based upon what's called, the proteins called, trans, RNA and proteins are called transcription factors. These are, it's a modular signaling system that tells the DNA, make this one and make that one and make this one. And, and then no, now make this one. And so there is a communication going on in, deep inside the, the cell telling the genes what to do. Now, how that's directed is really not clear. I also write the very last chapter of my book is about a molecule that I say seems to communicate as a molecule, not, not a, uh, so I get smaller and smaller. I talk about human cells that are huge, microbes that are tiny, viruses, then organelles, which are inside cells, those are little compartments. But the very last chapter is about a molecule that seems to operate like a cell. It, it seems to know and it sends information, it makes decisions, it's called mTOR. And that brings you to the molecule that seems to know what they're doing. And here you have some molecules inside the cell seems to know what they're doing. And of course, viruses are a molecule that very much uh, seem to know what they're doing. So the question becomes, how, where is this intelligence? Well, I believe it's in the, in the physics. It's in, the, it's in nature. I mean, it's in the matter and energy. It's below quarks. It's part of the structure of the physics of uh, reality. Well, so what's the, uh, the closest that people have come to understanding? I mean, before we understand cellular communication, how about the sensory apparatus of a cell, like the senome, you know, with, we can hear, taste, smell, touch, and well, feel. What about cells? What, what kind of senses or, or, you know, how do they sense things? Well, microbes, which are tiny compared to human cells, have a hexagonal lattice, a protein lattice all around the cell. And those seem to be uh, sensory systems that, that then trigger either by electricity or by molecules inside the cell. And then the metabolism of the microbe are these cycles of molecules that are, uh, you know, I think we all learned in high school, the, the Krebs cycle, and the, the citric acid cycle. So these cycles of chemicals are going and the microbe uses those as signals to say, well, no, go here, go here, send a little molecule to the other people because we're going to attack this human. Uh, we're about to attack the human gut. But in the larger human cells, which are thousands of times larger than a microbe, and, you know, the, the mitochondrion is the size of a microbe, and there are thousands, there could be thousands of mitochondria in one cell, and that's only a small part of the cell. So in the human cell, there are these very complicated membranes, and in the membranes are proteins kind of floating in this fatty membrane, and these proteins are receptors of all kinds and have attached to the proteins, these sort of strands like uh, filaments that are made out of sugars and fats. And those are the receptors of the human cells. Then the information gets translated from the surface into by molecules that go through all the way through the membranes down below and down below, they trigger a change of shape and they trigger uh, an action that will then use energy like ATP, and then they'll send a cascade of this molecule changes this molecule that changes this molecule. And it, it, you'll have a whole series of 20 molecules interacting that go all the way down into the nucleus. And then they uh, interact there and they make new genes, they make new proteins for new actions, such as building structures. Like let's say a cell is traveling up from the bone marrow up to the uh, tissue, it's using pseudopods. It's like an amoeba. It, you know, it's sort of stretching out here and the, the back part comes in. And all of that is done through tubules, microtubules and actin. Those are done through scaffolding molecules that are building and breaking and building. And uh, they seem to be close to the, these micro, these, these uh, scaffolding molecules seem to be close to uh, the intelligence of the cell. We call them uh, the Lego 
uh, I call it the Lego aspect of the cell. But some physicists believe that these microtubules are really quantum structures. Uh, there's a great a uh, scientist uh, who has written a lot about, actually he won the Nobel Prize uh, for black holes. And he believes that inside of microtubules are, are quantum computers. Unpro- it's unproven, you know, it's all unproven, but the mi- microtubules are quite remarkable in how they're constantly building and breaking down. And who's telling them to do that is the question. How do they know to do it so rapidly? You know, so the cell is moving. You know, it's traveling. It's how complicated is a is a cell? Is it as complicated as a city, like a major metropolitan city, or I would say analog in your mind? I'd say it's thousands of times more complicated than any. So each each cell, like each human cell, you think is more complicated than like Boston, Massachusetts, way more everything in it. Way wow. more, and it's um, we can't possibly build it. Like there's, you know, if you look at what a termite does, okay, yeah, a termite is this tiny little brain. They build a structure that human engineers can't possibly build. It's way beyond our capacity. They build these large mounds that change the atmosphere in the desert, that become a place where all kinds. Of, it changes the entire ecology. And it's like a huge air conditioning system. And it, it's like building a skyscraper that has a cooling system for the environment. It would be like building, you know, a hundred story building. And, and not only that, but if you come along and break it, they come racing out, fighting you and rebuild that spot. So they know how to build it. We couldn't possibly build it. Human engineers are way beyond human engineers. The, the molecules, one example, these are called macro large molecules and they form complexes these complexes are so complicated that we have no idea how any information could be building them like the ones in the mitochondria are an example they have so what what is a structure that just blows you away in, in its complexity okay, it's, called, it. it's called the electron transport chain and it's basically how all of life gets energy, how every one of our, almost every reaction needs this molecule ATP in order to, to, to power. And the question is, how do we get ATP? Well, the way we get it is we know that electrons run all of our machines, right? Through wires and computers. All of it's run through electrons. And electrons are a powerful force, and they're at various levels of power. You can have a low-level power running a light bulb. You can have a high-level power running a Tesla motor. You can have an extremely high-level power running some huge, uh, you know, skyscraper, whatever. Anyway, so in the cell, there are channels whereby electrons are taken from certain molecules and transferred to other molecules, and they form a pathway through a molecule that is uh, just beyond belief how complicated it is. And in all through this molecule, there are like 15 stations. And each station is a several iron molecules, copper molecules, which have unique, they have unique levels of energy to hold electrons and transfer them. And the electron goes from one to two to three to four, all the way through 15 of these. And each one is slightly less powered than the other. And so at each station, energy to use in chemical reactions uh, is thrown off by certain molecules. So these electrons traveling through this molecule then sends off other molecules that are then used uh, to make ATP later. Uh, so that's one of so one of the and and at the same time they're transferring hydrogen atoms out of the cell to make a force, and at the same time they are uh, making carbon dioxide and and burning oxygen. It's just it's fantastic. There are four of them, each more complicated than the next, and then the fifth one actually is a machine that is like a piston whereby those 
protons that were pumped over the membrane are now coming back through this piston. And as it comes through the piston, the piston turns, and that's how the ATP is made. Crazy. Not only could so, we not build this thing, we couldn't even, we can barely begin to figure it out. There right, are also right. channels for water. There are channels for oxygen. There's channels for electrons. There's channels for proton, protons. There's all kinds of channels in these huge, enormous molecules. And there's five of them all embedded in a membrane in the mitochondrion. The same thing happens with photosynthesis. It's a similar, it's, a, it's the opposite process whereby a, a, a ray of light, a photon, triggers an electron through a very complicated quantum process. And that electron starts an electron chain like we're talking about and creates energy. So those are the two ways that we have life energy. We can't even imagine this, the, the code to build this thing, let alone its structure is so far beyond our understanding. So how do you think life, life first began? How did life begin? Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's already, you know, the softball. So yeah, so most scientists who, the Darwinian random movement robotic crowd are looking for molecules that build themselves into a cell, which is, which is completely ridiculous because one of the scientists who's, who's very actively involved in that research and very famous, and he said it would be like playing a round of golf. And then the golf club goes back and rebuilds the golf course by itself, you know, in terms of uh, how we, whether we understand what happens. We don't have any idea how this complexity started, how it keeps going. We have no idea, but I think it has to be. I don't, you know, again, uh, logically to me, it has to be a, a part of, uh, matter and energy it has to be part of physics. It's part of the basic way that uh, reality is built. So life goes all the way down, just like quarks and matter and energy. It's all deep in the those. I view it in a funny way. So if if you, you know what orders of magnitude are, so if you get bigger and bigger, like a, a person to a house is one. 10, you know, one order of magnitude bigger, 10 times than a block, than a city, et cetera. There are about 26 orders of magnitude to the size of the, of the universe, of the galaxies. And if you go 20, and then if you go 26 orders of magnitude down from humans, small, you're at quarks where we cannot, theoretically, we cannot ever know anything smaller than a quark because we use larger things than quarks like electrons and photons to understand, to see. I mean, so that there's no way we'll know what's below it. That's why they can invent, uh, you know, string theory and uh, other worlds because they have no clue what's going on. So they make these re ridiculous theories. But the thing is, um, from quark size, if you go by quantum mechanics, the, there's a, uh, a thing called Planck. Planck was one of the great scientists who worked with Einstein. And he came up with the Planck size, which is 32 orders of magnitude smaller than after that 26, to, which is the limit of our universe. There's another 32 orders of magnitude smaller. To me, that's where uh, consciousness, that's where life that's where the structures the energy structures that you were looking for are the building blocks of life and consciousness are are deep in 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 that and it's we do know that it's it's like a um, a cauldron it's like you know it's like a bubbling particles coming and going and the, you know it's it's just a frothy right. cauldron of energy so to me well, it's very logical that's where life is that's where energy is where, where do you think the life is in a cell? Like if you were to take one apart piece by piece, well, that's where, where is the life in it for you? Where, where do you think, what do you think? Well, would my new book is about how you have brains at every level. So you have the human brain, you have the neuron itself has a brain. The dendrites are a brain. You have inside the cell, you have the, the transcription factor brain, which is a brain, you have the energy thing that we just talked about is a brain. And so at every single level, you have something as complicated as a brain. 
And then above us, our brain, we have our brain, but then there's the internet now. There's the super brain, you know, of all the science and literature and, and, and all the computerized stuff. That's like a, a bigger brain. Uh, so to me, uh, it's, I don't know what to call it, but there is the kind of thing you're looking for at every single level, every order of magnitude. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, so in my body, the cells that comprise my liver, do they, like, what level of, I mean, like, like, what, is there a hierarchy? Do, do my liver cells know that they're a part of this, this collective called liver or whatever they call it? Do they well, also they, know they're part of the body? Do they, like, what do you think cells know about themselves well, they, and about others in, the, in a holobion context? Well, they have to know because they do all kinds of very, very specific things that only liver cells do. In other words, they send out messages. They're dealing with fatty stuff. They're dealing with energy particles. They're dealing with uh, cholesterol. They're dealing with fatty acids. They're dealing with sugars. So they are sending signals to the rest of the body and responding to signals from the rest of the body in a very unique way. Each type of cell does that. Now, how... All of that comes from one cell beyond belief, but it is beginning to be teased out. And again, it goes back to these, the world of the transcription factors, which are the, these little molecules that are a language that determine how the cell is going to use its DNA and make certain things and not make other things. So those transcription factors determine at some point that you're going to become a liver cell and you're not going to be. Oh, and this is interesting. The guy who won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for making stem cells out of non-stem cells found the factors, which are some of these transcription factors, he found them from a virus that is embedded in us. So the virus sent us that information, which is used, and he then used those factors to make the first not- perfect stem cells, but pretty good. You know, there's some stems, the original stem cells can make any kind of cell. Many of them can only make, you know, this whole group of cells or, or, or whatever. They're, they're a medium level stem cell, but it involved the language of transcription factors, which is a protein language, which involves, you know, thousands of molecules. That same protein language in its development went to the DNA of the liver cell and said, you're going to become a liver cell and you're going to focus on this, this, and this, and not do this, this, and this. You're not going to do what neurons do. You're going to, I mean, you have to do a certain amount, the energy, the ATP, the mitochondria. Yeah. But you're going to deal with communication to other cells in the body around uh, lipids, around cholesterol, or, you know, you're going to deal with uh, certain issues. So, I mean, what, what kind of experimentation would you like to do if you had the budget and time? What would you want to figure out? What would you observe? Well, I'm not a laboratory person. I have enormous respect for laboratory people do all the, you know, the hard lifting here. I believe that a lot of this is known already and is in the vast literature that's coming out every day, but that no one understands what it is. And, and, and the thing is, what I've noticed about scientific information is that some little study is done in Ukraine, or it's done in Italy, or it's done at Harvard. And that information comes out today, tonight. And the title of that article is like gobbledygook. It's a bunch of genes. I mean, no one even knows what that title means unless you're like right in that little field. And then after, so then they do a little blurb about it. And if you're careful, like I am every night, you can capture these articles as they appear. So I call it doing my homework. I have to look every night through certain websites that have the summaries of the articles that were published that day. Okay. In all, the yeah. great, in all the great journals. And I also go through all the major journals, like all the nature journals, the science journals. And, you know, once a month, I'll go through them and, and extract articles. And most of it is lost because, you know, I don't know who else is doing this. 
and and I'm looking for certain things. I'm looking for the kind of answers you're asking me about, but there are a million other questions to look at. So what I would do is I would create a vast institute where we gather what we do know. And I think a tremendous amount of information is already known. A lot could be put together and then figure out. I mean, science is proceeding. There's like, it's huge. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of studies going on. And so I don't need to invent a study. I need to keep up with what is coming out in electricity, in energy, in, when I say energy, electricity, I mean, at the cellular level. Right. I need to come up with membranes. I need to come up with DNA and genetics. And well, is, is anyone trying to holistically do like a meta-analysis of cellular communication to find out everything about it? Or are you kind of doing that incrementally as you read? Yeah. So if in my book, I say, I wrote this book when I really, there, were, there was nothing on it. Well, there's a lot on it. There are books on cellular communication, but they're, a thousand pages of genetic gobbledygook. You know what I mean? I mean, I read it. I'm reading. They're just descriptive, you mean? I mean, no, it's pure science. It's pure molecular biology. It's genes and this, and this molecule and that molecule, this mechanism, this mechanism. It's almost impossible to read unless you're a specialist in the most narrow of fields. But there is no book like mine that just says, this is what is happening in this enormous field. So that's why I felt I had to write this level of a book. In other words, a book for everyone that summarizes what this level is about. Uh, my next book is just going to go deeper uh, into the next phase. I mean, the information is already a year old and a lot happens in a year, you know, uh, because you have to publish the book. You have to put it. In. I was able to get COVID in there. But that was the last thing. So maybe the information's a year old, but it's right. still uh, light years ahead of any other source of information in this field. Uh, that's the problem. Um, and it's a vastly complicated field that I'm trying to simplify so that anyone can understand yeah. it and realize what is, it's all about. I mean, what it's all about is that cells are talking to each other, making decisions, and that's how our body works. That's how our mind works. That's how our health is. That's how biology works. So what is life or what's the difference between a living thing and a non-living oh, thing? Like what well, are the hallmarks of things that make them living? Again, no one has any clue because we can't even define life. There's no definition of life that makes any sense. Actually, um, a book was just written about that by Zimmer, an excellent book talking about how any definition of life you come up with is incomplete. So it's it's like a, a circle. I, you know, usually people think of life as a cell that has a metabolism and reproduces. But there are cells that don't reproduce, like a neuron. Is it alive? Of course it's alive. You know, there are, are uh, animals that are dead where they have living cells still. So, I mean, it's very hard to define life. To me, if we go back to my speculation about what it's all about, it's that life and consciousness and intelligence are a fundamental part of matter. They're, they're, they're a part of every piece of energy and every piece of matter. And at some point, we'll figure out what that type of energy is. I mean, it's all based on electrons and photons. It all starts with photons and electrons and uh, protons because... The, pro, the electrons go through these molecules, the photons stimulate them, the protons go across the membrane, they create life energy, and everything is based upon that. So uh, everything is based on ATP, if you, you can define life that way. So it goes back to electrons and photons. And uh, therefore, it's, it's part of matter. Life is, is an essential... And, and my original thing about consciousness is, you know, searching for the mind. What is mind? Again, mind is an integral aspect of nature. It's everywhere. So what, uh, I, I don't know, like what, do you feel like there's a, a breakthrough coming in understanding of any of these principles in the near future? or I do. Far I do. off? And, and what kind yes. of breakthrough do you think? Well, like you said, there's the dead Darwin crowd. 
I mean, there's nothing against evolution. Evolution is a brilliant idea and it absolutely is happening. And you know? the problem is their robotic, you know, descriptions of what, how they think it works. It doesn't work the way they think it works. It works through jumping genes. It works through, you know, photons. It works through a million different ways, how the diversity occurs. So, as, you know, evolution is absolutely the uh, same aspect. I mean, consciousness is evolving. So uh, people evolve. Evolution is everywhere. So there's nothing against that concept. But then you have the dead Darwin dogmatic group that wants everything to be a rigid um, things bump into each other and it's all random, which is, which is absurd. It's ridiculous when you look at the facts, when you look at what I've written, when you look at these molecules that are so complicated to be designed that, you know, it's so far from random, it, it, it's laughable. I mean, it's absurd. But it's so nice to me, when, I, when I see these complicated systems, you know. So to me, when you talk about how does science advance, people think, oh, there's a revolution in ideas. Well, Another view is that the old professors dig in and never change their mind and keep their grants and keep trying to control the field in a narrow dogmatic way that's already been passed by. And the young people come up with the new ideas and the revolution occurs by the young people understanding uh, what's happening. So the young people today are not these rabid, atheistic, anti you know, intelligence people, I, I say atheistic. I mean, you don't need a God in this. You could have a God or not have a God. I don't know. You know, uh, I have my own view on that. But the fact is, intelligence in the universe is everywhere. And it's part of its nature. So consciousness and intelligence are part of its nature. If you then want to go into your next deep question, well, what does that say about God? That's a matter of belief. I mean, I, there is no proof of anything there. Well, very good. Uh, John, what's the best way for people to find out more about your book? Where is it sold? Where can they go? Um, it's sold everywhere. It's on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and every bookstore. It's called The Secret Language of Cells. Um, Searching for the Mind is my website and my Facebook page. My Twitter account, which is very active, a lot of discussion there, is... John Leaf MD at John Leaf MD. And again, Leaf is spelled L I E F F. It's this, you know, invented at Ellis Island name. So it's L I E F F J O N. And, but if you just look up the secret language of cells, uh, it's there everywhere. It's in the hardbound, it's in a Kindle, it's in the Barnes and Noble, it's, it, it can be read, it's in the audio. It's in every format. So, um, so. Well, very good. Very good. Well, John, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. And you're a rare <laughs> person to think these thoughts, uh, usually they're, uh, they're not allowed or they're beaten down by, by other people I've spoken to. So I'm glad. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.